In the last module, we talked about how the foot functions kind of out in outer space. We really didn't take gravity into uh, consideration, and and we really primarily looked at how the calf functions um, in plantar flexion, and how the uh, lateral compartment muscles function in eversion, and the and the anterior pretibials work in 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 dorsiflexion. But today, we want to spend some time looking at how the foot and ankle functions and to really have a good understanding of function we have to we have to review and, and look at those motions and look at those motions under loaded conditions so what I want to do is is start with a review of pronation and supination and you know look at the combined motions that closed chain pro, uh, pronation and So we want to look at the combined motions of closed chain pronation and and less significantly of open chain pronation. But as we look at what the calcaneus is doing with pronation, we can appreciate the calcaneal eversion that's occurring. So that's that frontal plane motion as the foot hits the ground and the uh, calcaneus begins to evert. The tail is sitting on top then of the calcaneus, falls to the inside. So the talus adducts or it rotates towards the midline. And then the talus also plantar flexes, it falls down and drives the navicular bone down. So when I look at that talocalcaneal navicular joint, we can appreciate the navicular being driven down towards the towards the floor. So that gives us that tailor plantar flexion. And what's the tibia going to do? Well, it's going to follow. So the, the tibia and the fibula are going to immediately rotate with that pronation. Now if I go back to space and I just do an open chain pronation, now all the motion is just occurring at the calcaneus. And, and this is really, we really don't have a, a muscle per se to do this. Um, but an open chain will have calcaneal eversion similar to closed chain. But then instead of the talus adducting, the calcaneus AB ducts, or it moves to the outside and it dorsiflexes. dorsiflexes. So it's, I think it's, it's relatively more challenging to appreciate an open chain picture of pronation when we're trying to visualize what the calcaneus is doing. I think it's much easier to appreciate closed chain pronation while the calcaneus is everting and the talus is, is adducting and, and falling into plantar flexion with that internal rotation or medial rotation of the, of the lower leg. So when I look at then closed chain supination, which is really the return of, of the uh, of the subtalar joint to that um, closed pack position, we can appreciate the calcaneal inversion that occurs with the talus coming back up and, and moving to away from the midline, so we get talar AB duction and the talus then dorsiflexes on top of the calcaneus and the tibia, uh, the tibia and the fibula are going to externally rotate. So it's one way to visualize that is, is the talus is falling off the calcaneus in pronation and in supination it gets pulled back on top of the calcaneus. So it, 
is better aligned over the, the joint and as such the joint is much more stable and the foot aligns, the bony alignment in the foot is greater and is more stable. So that closed pack position of the, of the subtalar joint of the foot is, um, is a supinated position. Now open chain, the calcanea, uh, the calcanea still inverts, but now we'll look at the movement relative to the talus is calcaneal adduction and calcaneal plantar flexion. Again, understanding the movement in the closed chain environment is paramount to understanding the importance of pronation and supination in uh, when their foot is is on the ground. So let's take a minute and and review the muscle control and I'll finish this little section with um, with a nice slide that's in your textbook that really um, provides a, a, a nice graphic of what the muscle function is in, in relation to um, those force vectors. So again, just to review quickly, anterior compartment muscles are the ones that are responsible for dorsiflexion include the tibialis anterior, the extensor digitorum longus, and the extensor holicus longus. And again, keep in mind that as the foot hits the ground, what keeps, what, what slowers the, lowers the rate of, of plantar flexion are these muscles in the anterior compartment. And we'll hear them called the pretibials, especially when we're talking about uh, gait and gait function. We'll, oftentimes we'll call these the pretibials and they're responsible for slowing down the rate of plantar flexion when your heel hits the ground and, and you're moving to that that foot flat foot flat position. Muscles in the lateral compartment, you know we talk about them as being everters um, and they're the the pronius longus and the pronius brevis and what I want to really make sure we we point out is is the rate is the route that the pronius longus takes uh, across the the pronial groove in the in the cuboid and attaching in the base of the first ray and, and uh, first cuneiform um, so we see that nice we see that nice uh, angular um, motion um, of the of the tendon okay and the brevis attaching right on the on the uh, fifth metatarsal tuberosity so if I have an axis of rotation that is in the ankle that is here you can see that these are posterior so these are both going to be you know going to have a component of plantar, plantar flexion which is really uh, going to slow the rate of dorsiflexion down as the foot hits the ground, and and we'll learn with uh, with some of its friends that it has a significant input on control at the knee. In the posterior compartment, we need to appreciate the gastroc and the soleus as you know primarily plantar flexor muscles. But again, we're going to learn that their impact is. A function of slowing down the rate of tibial advancement which will have an impact on slowing down and eventually stopping the rate of dorsiflexion um, through the gait cycle is as well as the knee so it'll have an impact on the knee and then what is controlling the midfoot and some of those pronation forces is the tibialis posterior, the flexor hallucis longus, and the flexor digitorum longus. And we can see where those tendons come through at the, at the medial uh, tunnel behind the, the medial malleolus, um, attaching into the navicular tubercle, and then down into the toe, in, into all five toes. So this is that graphic that I mentioned earlier, 
and I really like this graphic because it takes the axes of the tailor cruel joint and the subtalar joints and looks at where the impact is going to have uh, on the um, on ankle motion. So everything that is on posterior to my talocrural joint axis is going to result in plantar flexion. So pronus brevis, pronus long, this is the what we're calling the triceps surrey, which is the Achilles tendon attachment of of the gastroc and the soleus and the plantaris. Uh, flexor digitorum, tibialis uh, posterior, flexor hollis longus. All of those muscles are going to slow down the rate of dorsiflexion when the foot hits the ground. But also looking at the joint axis of the subtalar joint and those muscles that are on the medial versus the lateral side. So those, those muscles that are on the lateral side are going to be responsible for pronation and those muscles that are on the on the uh, medial side are going to be responsible for supination so really when we look at it again functionally it's these muscles that are on this side that are slowing down the rate of pronation and kind of re-establishing a supinated position whereas these muscles are slowing down the rate of supination and may be assisting in pronation. But again, the important component from the sub tailor joint perspective is what drives motion into pronation is really ground reaction force when the heel hits the ground. Well, one other thing I want to do, I do want to mention is this Achilles tendon attachment. Um, this actually is a great representation because you can see that the, the subtalar joint axis goes through a piece of it. So there is a component that assists in pronation and a component that assists in supination. So what that allows us to appreciate is when the axis changes depending on the joint position, I can have a tendon or a muscle that influences what we would think of as being contradictory motions. But when that heel makes initial contact and it lands on the lateral aspect of the calcaneus and starts to be, you know, in ground reaction forces start to drive it into that calcaneal everted position the Achilles will actually assist in calcaneal eversion initially. And then as the foot hits the, the ground and we start going through the sequence, it then moves to the medial side of the axis, line of the axis, and reverts into a into becoming a an inverter of the uh, of the hind foot. What muscle, or excuse me, what uh, ligaments then are responsible for support of the longitudinal arch? Well, we have a series of, of four supporting structures, uh, supporting structures, and and initially we can we can appreciate the long plantar ligament, the short plantar ligament, and the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. Sometimes you'll hear that plantar, plantar calcaneal navicular ligament referred to as the spring ligament. These are at, at uh, varying levels within, within the depth and the most superficial of these three, and, and you may have noticed that I haven't talked about the plantar aponeurosis yet, which is the most superficial of the supporting structures, but it, it, it warrants its own um, few slides here. But the, when I, as I go through the, the depth, um, plantar aponeurosis is the most superficial. Then I'm the, the long plantar ligament, the short plantar ligament, and the plantar calcaneal navicular ligament. 
So those are ligaments that are responsible for static stability within the uh, longitudinal arch. The plantar aponeurosis, and you will typically hear this referred to as the plantar fascia. The plantar fascia has three different bands. It has a, a medial, an intermediate, and a, and a lateral band. And this is an old dissection that I did a number of years ago looking at the, looking at the uh, plantar um, fascia. And it attaches at the calcaneus and the medial band has been dissected away but it actually has a uh, a band to the navicular tuberosity and then down um, and blending with the central band and in inserting into the proximal phalanx of all five toes which means that when the toes are in a neutral position the, the tension on the plantar fascia is somewhat relaxed and as those toes go into extension the tension on the when the toes go into extension the tension on the plantar fascia goes up so it essentially pulls the calcaneus towards the metatarsal heads so it's tightening, it's shortening, tightening the, the plantar fascia, which is going to act as a truss to pull the, um, and increase the height of the longitudinal arch. So here's a, a, a diagram of how that really functions. And, and sometimes you'll hear this called a, a tie and truss system in that the tie rod represented by the spring is the plantar fascia and there is a posterior strut and an anterior strut which would be the alignment then of the of the hind foot and the forefoot so as i increase tension on the tie rod it drives my struts up and remember as i said uh, earlier that the closed pack position of the foot is that supinated position and that's when I have the greatest amount of bony alignment so with that bony alignment I can I can really understand the significance of the plantar aponeurosis or the plantar fascia as it is tightened as the toes go up creating stability in the in the foot with not a significant contribution of muscular action so I can I can develop a nice rigid lever to propel myself off of by tensing the, the tie rod and increasing the the load on this posterior and anterior strut so it works very similar to this idea of a windlass um, mechanism where when the toes are in their neutral position the arch is able to collapse that collapse takes the foot into its open packed position and allows us to feel the ground absorb forces and as we go into an extended toe position in the latter phase of the uh, latter latter part of the stance phase we increase the tension on the plantar fascia, it increases the height of the arch, it locks the foot into a uh, closed pack position and provides a rigid lever for us to propel ourselves forward. Now we also have that dynamic support of the longitudinal arch. And it starts really with the gastroc and the soleus. And remember early, a couple of slides ago I talked about the gastroc and the soleus and the Achilles being a initial calcaneal everter and that's just for a fraction of a second and then as that force moves or the axis moves um, to the in inversion side of the equation then the Achilles and the gastroc become an inverter of the hind foot which as we remember goes with supination 
So that gastroc soleus moves the hind foot into a position of supination. The posterior tibialis, where it crosses from the medial side, lifts the navicular bone. And the posterior longus, where it attaches to the first ray, and this is a, a, a plantar view, I'm looking at the bottom of the foot, will actually take the first ray and pull it into the ground. So I have posterior tib lifting the navicular bone and the pronus longus pr providing a, a dorsiflexion force, uh, inversion force on the first ray. So let's take a look at how this really, the sub joint provides the functional link between the leg and the forefoot during, during normal activity. And this is our opportunity to get a little bit of an introduction into how the foot works during gait. So we're gonna start talking a little bit about gait. We're gonna start to see some stick figures that we're going to get uh, very familiar with as we get further along into this whole gait um, analysis. And during normal gait, our reference leg is our dark leg and our, our uh, opposite leg or the contralateral leg is, light, is the light colored one. So when our heel hits the ground, sometimes you'll hear that called heel strike and in other instances you'll hear it called initial contact. And I'm going to call it initial contact through the rest of this course. And that point in time at which heel contact occurs, it occurs on the lateral aspect of the calcaneus. So with that initial contact on the lateral aspect and a ground reaction force that's moving up through the foot, then the motion that the foot is going to want to move toward is that pronation position. And you'll see that my toes are off the ground so my pre-tibials are loaded and going to slowly lower the forefoot to the ground as we move into that pronated position. Now, when I look at this, this slide, we can call this loading response because now I, my weight has shifted to the front foot my foot has lowered down, so my pretibials have lowered my foot down. My tibia is now vertical. I have increased medial rotation of the tibia. I have increased pronation, so my foot is flattening out as the joint is loaded. And my hind foot and my forefoot are moving into an open pack position. That's important as it allows our foot to accept abnormal or uneven ground surfaces and it allows us to transmit some forces through the foot and dissipate some forces through the foot. So now at mid stance I've moved my body forward over over my support foot and we'll notice that my knee is straight the soleus and the gastroc fire to help really control the progression of the um, of that tibia forward. And now the posterior tib, now again if my soleus and my gastroc are firing I'm creating an inversion uh, force on the hind foot so I'm starting to slow down that pronation at the hind foot and I'm creating, initiating the motion of supination so I can start to roll out of that weight acceptance phase and start to move to a more propelling phase. And, and when I'm propelling, I want to have a more rigid foot. So initially the gastroc soleus, primarily soleus, is going to be responsible for that. And we'll learn that the, that the gastroc is actually controlling more things at the knee uh, in terms of rotation as we look at this closer with uh, our analysis of, of gait. The progression of the, of the tibia is being controlled by the soleus. So it slows the soleus or stops the, so, so the tibia from moving forward 
that allows the body to come over the top of the knee or over the top of the foot and extend. So this is when I start talking about the soleus, even though it doesn't cross the knee, becomes a contributor to knee extension. And then at the midfoot, the posterior tibialis is starting to try to slow down the rate of pronation. We're loading the posterior tip so that it can, can start to move back into a position of supination. Now terminal stance is identified where that, that point in time when the heel comes off the ground. So now I have created, I've stopped the tibia from, from forward progression. So the heel now comes off the ground. In the event that the soleus or the gastroc is, is not functioning, the heel would stay on the ground and the knee would collapse. So that controls the, the tibia from collapsing. The posterior longus, uh, or excuse me, the posterior tibialis and the pronus longus aid in, in resupinating. So when that heel comes off the ground, that's when we need that more rigid lever so that our force can be transmitted into, into the ground. And we'll look and we'll start to see some toe extension. So now our toes are, come, are, are starting to extend and that will have an impact on the windlass effect. So at that point in time when, when my toes are extended, my foot can stay in that, in that rigid lever supported position and the electrical activity starts to decrease. So I start changing from a dynamic stability to a more static stability. And that's what contributes to our, our closed pack position with decreased muscle activity, more energy efficiency. And then as our toes leave the ground, that begins the swing phase and initial swing results with the tibia being externally rotated and swinging forward and the foot and ankle are unlocked during the swing phase and the dorsiflexors are re-engaged to dorsiflex the foot and pull the toes up so that they have an opportunity to clear the ground. As, as we walk, you know, we only have about a centimeter of clearance from side to side so it's, it's, it's pretty important to clear those toes as we um, as we progress forward, so that's a a, a great uh, example of how the foot and ankle function in real life, and the importance of understanding the reverse action of the muscles, the open chain and closed chain relationships of all 26 bones in the foot, and how they relate to to normal movement. Okay, so until next time, let's work on uh, on understanding what the. Um, until next time, let's work on understanding the. Until next time, let's understand the importance of the kinematic chain and the kinetic chain in normal function.